Next on Weapons at War. Today, it owns the sky, poised to strike any target anywhere in the world at any time. From primitive wooden biplanes to flying fortresses over Europe, from Operation Rolling Thunder in Vietnam, smart bombs in the Persian Gulf, and technology beyond, the bomber. Next on Weapons at War. Before the First World War, nations could rely on geographical distance to protect themselves. Their populations, industrial centers, and reserve forces seemed secure, nestled far behind the combat erupting over the distant horizon. But the bomber holds no regard for that geographical shield. It creates total war, a war where destruction can come to any place at any time. The bomber cripples a nation's ability to supply its army and crushes its will to fight. Field somewhere in the Mideast, a B-52 crew prepares for another combat sortie over Iraq. The 35-year-old bomber's payload is similar to what it carried in Vietnam, 60,000 pounds of free-fall explosive bombs. The mission is also familiar, round-the-clock carpet bombing of enemy troop concentrations. While Desert Storm commanders relied on the B-52 for conventional area bombardment, they turned to smaller bombers for individual target strikes. With a radar jammer cloaking them from behind, F-111 bombers slipped into Iraqi airspace undetected on a routine basis. Their load was lighter, but their bombs were smarter. The strategic bombing campaign was relentless. Combined with other fighter bombers, the F-111's laser-guided munitions systematically dismantled the Iraqi military infrastructure with surgical precision. After 38 days, aerial bombardment set the stage for one of the most lopsided military victories in history. And F-111 crews finally proved themselves in combat. What we did tonight, basically, we launched out at dark uh, four CBU-87s uh, to hit Balad airfield, try to suppress some of the AAA from medium altitude. We put the CBU-87s on the target. We saw approximately six to eight canisters hit, uh, and from our impression, when we left, there was less AAA going up than there was when we came in. Uh, we released ours from a higher altitude than planned due to the AAA coming up higher than originally expected. It was still a computer uh, delivery uh, off a of radar, so we uh, feel we got a real good hit. And then as we were coming back out, we saw more canisters going off for the guys coming in uh, behind us. Coming from the target area, they're still shooting at you. You can see the tracers and all that. And uh, you know it's uh, not over by a long shot, but the further away you get, the better it starts to feel. But uh, like Colonel Malone says, until you cross the border, uh, you're not really breathing the, the full sigh of relief. After its performance in Desert Storm, the F-111 is now considered one of the most lethal bombers in the world. 
Although the Air Force never officially gave it a name, the pilots who fly it call it the Aardvark, in reference to its long nose. But looks can be deceiving. This anteater has teeth. The F-111 was the first jet aircraft to employ variable sweep wings. When pinned back, they reduced drag, allowing speeds two and a half times the speed of sound. Turbofan engines with afterburners are standard equipment on all of today's jet fighters, but the Aardvark was the first to have them in 1964. Perhaps the F-111's most important component is its terrain-following radar. In flight, the radar flies the plane automatically, adjusting its height to match the curvature of the Earth. This allows the bomber to streak across enemy lines lower than 200 feet above the ground, day or night, rain or shine. Despite its uh, success tactically in Desert Storm, we're going to see the F-111 pass into, a, into history as an aircraft which perhaps uh, came as the last of the small-scale bombers, uh, not quite a fighter, not quite a bomber. And what we're going to see replacing it are aircraft which are basically capable of doing both roles. When the F-111 is finally retired, it will join an impressive lineup of bomb-carrying aircraft developed in this century. The bomber has indeed come a long way in just one lifetime. When Orville and Wilbur Wright delivered the first military airplane to the U.S. Army Signal Corps in 1908, their flying machine was looked on as more of a novelty than a weapon. The Wright brothers themselves saw their aircraft as a passive reconnaissance vehicle that could spare the lives of horse-riding cavalry scouts. It wasn't until three years later that the first aerial bombs were dropped in anger. Well, the Italians dropped the first aerial bombs in warfare on Turkish troops, and uh, for all the practical significance, it might as well have been provolone. It didn't cause any casualties. But in philosophic terms, it alerted the visionaries around the world that something new was on the scene. Very shortly thereafter, bombs were dropped in the Balkans, and France dropped bombs in Morocco, so it set the stage. By 1914, the war that would end all wars spread across Europe, and despite their lack of experience, French, British, German, and Italian pilots took to the skies, inventing the art of aerial warfare. Bombing tactics were still in their infancy, and most airplanes were used primarily to photograph enemy troop locations. By the time the Americans entered the war, their air service was ranked 14th in the world. The Army's flight school curriculum wasn't too demanding. Cadets were required to make their own practice bombs out of plaster. Before their final check ride, each student was allowed 50 hours to practice flying in trainers like the Curtis Jenny. The Army was producing airmen, but the Americans had no combat-worthy airplanes. The United States went to Europe to find aircraft that it could duplicate in this country. It had no indigenous aircraft designs. One of them that was selected was the de Havilland DH-4, a bombing plane that appeared in 1917 over the Western Front. In this country, the Dayton Wright Company was authorized to build the airplane by the government. They had on hand a uh, DH-4 from England and the plans. The bomber's body was forged from steel, while the wings were built using wood and canvas. Each airplane received a 400 horsepower, water-cooled, 12-cylinder Liberty engine. Once tested, they were broken down, boxed up, and shipped off to assembly sheds in Europe. In May 1918, the first DH-4s rolled onto the grass airfields in France. In all, 4,500 de Havilland's were built. Before long, there were too many planes and not enough bombs to go around. So we take three inch shell casings and just chunk them full of all kinds of stuff, everything we could put in there and make our own bombs. And we would uh, get over a road while we were supposed to be observing for enemy activity and everything. And we'd uh, see a line of trucks. So we'd, uh, we'd try to work out our windage 
and we'd let them go, see. And then we'd fire them back, and we'd try to watch the tra trajectory as they dropped. And sometimes we'd be two or three hundred yards off target, and we had no smart bombs. They were just blah. And uh, so uh, we, had, we hit, made some good hits. We got pretty good. The aerial bombs improved as well. A new device, the fusing propeller, was introduced for the safety of the pilots. The bombs wouldn't be completely fused until they had fallen far enough for passing air to spin their propellers off. Germany's massive twin-engine Gotha bomber was among 8,000 military aircraft flying over the Western Front by the summer of 1918. Until then, neither side had used its aircraft in a coordinated effort. The Allies were the first to try. Under the command of America's brash Air Service Commander, Colonel Billy Mitchell, 1,500 Allied planes converged on one target, Samiel. Three waves of 500 planes each crossed the German front line, dropping their bombs and strafing targets of opportunity. The German war machine succumbed within hours. But without German air opposition, the Allied raid was considered only a limited success. By the war's end, only a handful of America's top brass were convinced of the bomber's potential. Among them was Billy Mitchell, who recognized that future battles would be decided in the air. The years following the war were marked by continued rivalry between the Army and Navy air services. The Navy believed airship carriers and battleships could deter aggression from America's shores and seemed more interested in building big balloons than big airplanes. An armada of battleships with 12-inch guns already patrolled the Atlantic and Pacific coasts. But since his return from France, Billy Mitchell had argued that battleships were obsolete, expensive, and vulnerable to attack from the air. As you might imagine, the Navy reacted as, as the more senior service would react, and the Secretary of the Navy, Josephus Daniels, said that he'd be glad to stand bareheaded upon the deck of any battleship that the Air Service carried to attack. In 1921, Congress gave Mitchell the chance to prove himself. With the Navy looking on, Mitchell's bombers set their sights on the captured German battleship Ostfriesland, considered by many to be impregnable with its thick air pocket hull design. Seven bombers each dropped a 2,000-pound bomb on the ship. In just 20 minutes, the Ostfriedsland disappeared beneath the surface. Officially, the Navy was unimpressed. They ordered more tests. For the next two years, Mitchell's men experimented with one-ton bombs on obsolete U.S. warships, demonstrating pinpoint accuracy. Strategic bombing theorists took heart. Britain's General Trenchard, Italy's Douay, and Caproni had all predicted the bomber would one day strike at the enemy's heartland, destroying factories that manufacture weapons before they had a chance to be used. Mitchell's tests confirmed the bomber's explosive potential. In 1923, the Army flew a T-2 transport coast to coast for the first time. The record-setting trip illustrated the difficulty of projecting air power at great distances. The T-2 had to assume 780 gallons of fuel and weighed 10,000 pounds before taking off on a bomber that would leave little room for a payload. Air-to-air -air refueling was one answer, but ideally the Army Air Corps needed a plane to replace the biplane Keystone bomber in service at the time. One such craft was the Martin B-9, the first all-metal bomber. While this single-winged bird boasted a top speed of 163 miles per hour, its fame was short-lived. In 1934, the Martin designers outdid themselves with the B-10 bomber. The all-metal twin-engine monoplane was considered an engineering marvel for its day. Its cockpit was enclosed, its landing gear was retractable, and its bomb load was carried internally. The B-10 could carry over 2,000 pounds of bombs, and at 207 miles per hour, 
It was the fastest bomber in the world. Martin B-10 was just like a, a gift from God uh, in terms of its beauty and its speed. Uh, the V-10 dispensed with the uh, uh, biplane wings, which were very significant, not only from the fact that they created a lot of drag, but were so uh, prone to difficulty in weather. They would ice up so badly. You couldn't put de-icers, for example, on a, uh, on a biplane. It was not really a weapon yet. It didn't have self-sealing tanks. It didn't have enough armor. It didn't have enough armament. But it did have a Norden bombsite, which came in about that time, and it gave the Air Corps planners an idea of what they could do when they got a bomber. As World War II approached, the British stepped up their bomber production. Their twin-engine Douglas Boston was fast at 325 miles per hour, but had a range of just 1,000 miles. By the end of the 30s, there were a large number of bomber designs available. The problem was getting suitable air power. Other nations saw the advantages of using large bomber aircraft and develop them themselves. So we had a situation in the end of the 1930s where there were a number of aircraft designs available. The Germans in particular had drawn a lot of lessons from what uh, the British were doing. The commander-in-chief of the Japanese combined fleet, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, had plans of his own crippled the United States fleet at Pearl Harbor, and Japan would be free to take the rich resources of Southeast Asia. The Japanese strike force was counting on wooden-finned torpedoes to strike the Pacific carrier fleet in the shallow water at Pearl. Whether the plan succeeded or not depended on the torpedo attack. First, we had to compare the depth of Pearl Harbor with the depth of our own torpedoes when dropped. As long as it was shallower than Pearl Harbor, I knew our plan would work. The air attack had spectacular results. 2,335 Americans dead, 188 aircraft destroyed, and four battleships sunk. As Billy Mitchell predicted 20 years earlier, air power destroyed the invincible dreadnoughts. For the Americans to strike back, they would need a new four-engine bomber capable of reaching Japan. By late summer 1942, the U.S. 8th Air Force began conducting massive daylight raids against German targets. The target for the day is Anchor. The high group and the 764th will be low. Hey, bombardiers, take your time in going in on your releases. Ten men were needed to operate America's first mass-produced four-engine bomber, the B-17. With its 11 machine guns, it lived up to its nickname as the Flying Fortress. Most of the crew went to combat before they were 22. Teenagers going out to war at 20,000 feet. Plane after plane would take up position over the English Channel, squadron joining squadron in tight formation. Of course, the primary reason for that formation was self-protection. Because if you look at it closely, with the lead airplane and then the airplane on his right wing being a little bit higher and the airplane on his left wing being a little bit lower, both behind, all their guns clear. They took all the insulation out when they got to England. You couldn't touch the side of the airplane with your hands and pull them away. You'd freeze. Your fingers would freeze right to the side of the airplane. The moment the formation crossed the coast of France, they were easy targets for German guns. To us, flak was uh, an irritant. We'd go into the flak to so the German fighters would leave us alone. Fighters would uh, decimate formations if they got themselves coordinated properly. German radar alerted fighter pilots on the ground, but they bided their time. They knew the B-17s wouldn't break formation. They had the advantage. They knew when they were going to attack. We didn't know when they were going to attack. Going east, they loved to have hail attacks because their sun was behind, would be behind them then. The tail gunner would uh, bounce the airplane. He'd 
call the pilot. When he saw them fire, he'd say bounce, and the pilot would take the airplane up 40, 50 feet, or down 40, 50 feet. And uh, amazingly enough, you could uh, avoid being hit that way unless they pressed the attacks close, came right in. Going down the bomb run, when the bombardier had identified the target area, the bomb site controlled the airplane. Trigger locked in, bomb bay doors open, select the bombs. When the two indices came up and met, there's electrical impulse, went to the bomb bay, released all the bombs. It was always a great relief uh, to uh, release the bombs. For some reason, uh, I guess you figured the job was really done. You go in for the United States and come back on your own. <laughs> in October 1943, the 100th Bomb Group sent 13 B-17s in a raid deep into Germany. Only one returned. Quite a few airplanes came back very seriously damaged. Uh, and uh, in fact, the B-17 had a reputation of being uh, able to take a tremendous amount of punishment and still get, get home. I saw the airplane that came back with the uh, nose compartment completely blown away and the navigator and the bombardier both fell out. After each mission, there would be an empty hard stand where a B-17 was parked the night before, and empty bunks where men had slept. By the end of the war, the 8th Air Force lost 46,000 of its men. The B-17s were by no means alone in England. They bombed by day, and the British bombed by night. The Lancaster bomber was the classic night bomber of the Second World War. The fact that it could uh, operate uh, over long ranges, eventually it was equipped with radar, made it actually quite a formidable weapon for the Germans to defend against. And it was, I suppose, respected by the Germans as being a capable aircraft. Because of its great range, the B-24 Liberator was best suitable for long over-the-water missions. Its specialty was the sub-hunt. Small twin-engine bombers like the B-25 Mitchell also left their mark. World War II, the uh, B-25, B-26, were all necessary for uh, short-range bombing operations behind the enemy lines uh, to interdict their rail and road supply, where it wouldn't have been economical to use flying fortresses and, and uh, B-24s. The B-26 Martin Marauder was especially suited for low-level infiltration. Nineteen forty three saw the arrival of the first bomber designed for hemisphere defense, the B twenty nine Super Fortress, the most advanced bomber of its day. Gunnery system was very modern. Previously the gunners had had to operate within the gun turrets and handle the guns themselves. When the B twenty nine they were remotely controlled. And the aircraft was pressurized, it had a pressurized crew compartment up in the nose, and then behind the aft bomb bay was another crew compartment where the gunners operated, and finally the tail was also in the pressurized portion of the airplane. When the Americans finally captured the Marianas Islands in the South Pacific, they had a launching point for sustained bombing raids against Japan. They prepared on each of these airfields, there were five of them, 
uh, 8,500-foot runways, which are pretty modest by today's thinking, but that's what we had, and we used most all of that footage on these heavyweight takeoffs. The B-29 would weigh 70 tons, 140,000 pounds, and you always hoped that every one of the engines would perform well because the takeoff was the most critical part of the entire mission. The missions to Japan and back were 2,600 miles, more than twice that of any in the European theater. With nothing but ocean beneath them, a slight navigational error in any direction meant they would run out of gas. Crippled bombers had nowhere to go but home. Some barely made it back. The B-29s needed an island between them and Japan and Iwo Jima became a top priority for U.S. Marines. Iwo Jima is probably one of the most critical pieces of territory that you could have thought of if you were flying missions like we were in the spring of 1945. To us, it meant a sanctuary for a B-29 in trouble, either due to fuel or mechanical trouble. He could go there and land. The super fortresses were proving to be reliable, but their bombing accuracy left much to be desired. Dropping their bombs from 30,000 feet protected the 11-man crews from ground fire, but allowed the bombs a free fall of six miles. Unpredictable winds often undid the best intentions of pilots and bombardiers. After taking over the 21st Bomber Command, General Curtis LeMay reassessed the B-29's bombing record and took the biggest gamble of his career. His order? Remove the gunners and ammunition to make room for more bombs. Fly at night and fly low level. I can remember that briefing because we all sat in a big Quonset hut and when we heard the bombing altitudes, at first there was a silence throughout the hall and then a great gasp from all of the crew members as they realized what they had just heard. Given most of Japan's buildings were made of wood, LeMay was counting on a new weapon the incendiary bomb. Even if they didn't hit their targets, LeMay bet their fires would. On that first mission, there were 300 B-29s, which took off from Guam and Tinian and Saipan. Here we would be flying with no light showing, in the dark, with uh, just individual aircraft, no formation. We're all going toward the same place at the same time. We uh, saw pieces of houses, like windows and doors, uh, actually going by the airplane at around 8,000 feet. I've never been in worse turbulence in an aircraft anywhere that was stronger than that night, March 10th, over Tokyo. I thought the wings were surely going to be just ripped off the aircraft. The bonfire that was going on down there on the surface was throwing heat upward, but the turbulence was from that heat rising. Then you could not help but sympathize with the people on the ground. There were thoughts about the folks on the ground and what they had to be suffering. In our first uh, firebombing of Tokyo, it was so bad that many Japanese themselves properly figured that it was the beginning of the end for them. On August 6th, a lone B-29 crossed over the coast of Japan with an even deadlier weapon. Its payload, one bomb. Its target, Hiroshima. At a height of 800 feet, an atomic bomb detonated, releasing an explosive force equivalent to 1,000 fully loaded B-29s. The potential to destroy whole cities with a single bomb became the ultimate projection of military power. The nuclear bomber had become the most lethal weapon in the U.S. arsenal. For 30 years, military strategists had predicted the day when aircraft could deliver a blow powerful enough to obliterate an entire city. With the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the concept of strategic bombing had finally realized its full devastating potential the power not only to destroy one city, but to force the surrender of an entire nation. With the advent of the jet engine, strategic bomber development changed radically. In the meantime, new bombers were technically obsolete on arrival. 
including the enormous B-36. The B-36 is just unbelievable to, to imagine something that the 230-foot wingspan. Think of it in terms of a relationship to a football field. Football field being, what, 300 feet, 100 yards. And here we're looking at 230 feet, three quarters of the football field. You can imagine that for a wingspan with these six pusher props on the back side of the wing. The B-36 was originally designed to strike Germany from the United States if American bases in Britain were lost. Consequently, it had an incredible range of nearly 7,000 miles. The B-36 has the distinction of never firing a shot in anger, and it retired quietly in 1959. In 1946, Northrop Aircraft debuted its version of the bomber of the future, the XB-35 Flying Wing. Jack Northrop had argued for years that a flying wing was superior to an aircraft with tail surfaces that produced so much drag. At 393 miles per hour, the wing was faster and more agile than the B-36, but it too had propellers, which made it obsolete. The Air Force converted two of the wings to jet propulsion, but the gas-guzzling jets cut the craft's range in half. Amid much controversy, the flying wing was shelved for a time. Since the late 40s, nothing has influenced American bomber design more than the Cold War with the Soviet Union. The Soviet's first MiG-15 jet fighter was cause for concern. One proposal to counter the MiG threat was the XF-85 Goblin. This parasite escort was designed to ride underneath the B-29. If a MiG-15 was identified, the Goblin would swoop down and attack the Russian jet with four machine guns. Unfortunately, the Goblin was little more than a flying jet engine and had poor handling characteristics. Like the flying wings before it, the program was discontinued and the Air Force canceled its order for 30 more Goblins in 1947. The same year, the Air Force's first large jet-powered nuclear bomber made its maiden flight. The B-47 Stratojet was the first large aircraft to incorporate swept-back wings and tail surfaces. The concept of strategic air power had always been to penetrate the enemy's front line, to strike at his heartland. In the Korean conflict, B-29 struck virtually every strategic target in four months following North Korea's invasion. But this time, the enemy's heartland was in communist China. Political considerations suddenly came into play in the nuclear age. After years of prototype testing, one of the most remarkable and enduring bombers ever rolled out in 1954. The B-52 Stratofortress was born. The eight-engine bomber carries a crew of six on two decks. Below are the navigator and radar nav stations. Above, the electronic warfare officer and the gunner are positioned behind the pilot and co-pilot seats. Now the B-52 came along, and with the B-47, when they were in combat, the United States had a strategic supremacy over the entire world that no nation, not even Britain, at the height of her power, ever exercised. The B-52s were designed as a high-level bomber armed with nuclear weapons, free-fall weapons. Uh, and with aerial refueling, it could strike anywhere in the world. And it had an enormous electronic countermeasure capability, too, the first one. In 1957, the American government took the decision to always have a number of bomber aircraft. The numbers always remain secret, either in the air or in their bases, fully manned and armed with nuclear weapons, capable of striking at targets in the Soviet Union on the command of the president. When you were on alert, your life was conducted pretty much like a firefighter's would be. Although you were out of your flight suit, your boots were alongside your bed, as was your flight suit. So if perchance the klaxon sound, the alarm sounded during the hours of sleep, make no mistake about it, you'd be awakened, regardless of how sound asleep you were, and responded immediately.
Within 15 minutes, the B-52s were expected to be airborne en route to selected sites in the Soviet Union. Only final instructions from headquarters kept them from flying all the way. So you responded and were ready to go. But the ability to recall you is, is very good. Well, superb. But what is really interesting is that no other country has gone down the road since the 60s of developing bomber aircraft, four-engine bombers, other than the Soviet Union and the United States. Really, that's because of the nuclear deterrence. That's because people want to carry nuclear weapons, and also because it costs so much to build a bomber. By the early 60s, the Soviet's air defense network had become more complex than ever. The surface-to-air missile was emerging as a threat greater than MiG fighters. The Air Force was convinced a high-altitude supersonic plane could outpace the missiles and replace the B-52 fleet. North American aviation soon began development of the XB-70 Valkyrie, a futuristic bomber capable of flying three times the speed of sound. Although the XB-70 was a stunning technological achievement, the Soviets shot down a high-flying American U-2 spy plane two years earlier. This confirmed the fear that a combination of radar, computers, and surface-to-air missiles had made Soviet air penetration suicidal at best. In 1964, the XB-70 program was canceled. The fact is that the Russians uh got the U-2 by salvoing an enormous number of missiles. They even shot down some of their own airplanes that were in pursuit of, of the U-2 at the time. Uh, and uh, a high altitude bomber probably could have continued to penetrate for a few years. Uh, in actual fact, the, in retrospect, the decision was probably a good one. The B-70 probably would have come into squadron service just about a time when the uh, missiles had uh, matured on the Russian side, on the Soviet side, so that it would have been at risk. Uh, the end result was that they improvised. The Air Force converted a portion of its B-52 force to carrying conventional bombs. One year later, they would see combat for the first time in the skies over Vietnam. In February of 1965, American bombers returned to the Marianas Islands and B-52 squadrons set up operations in Guam. Originally, as I recall, they went over there with the, uh, the uh, F-model aircraft. And then they discovered later on that there was a better capability by utilizing the D-model aircraft with a modification in the bomb bay. They called it Big Belly. And by putting bombs internally and maybe 12 under the wings, they were able to employ a system that was far more effective. While bombers like the B-57 were attacking targets in North Vietnam, the B-52s made the biggest impact explosively and psychologically. Ironically, the high-altitude nuclear bombers were now playing a conventional role of close air support and received their targeting information directly from the ground. The forward uh, air controller could call the strike force, which was already airborne, in the target area, and give them the target, give them the size of the box they wanted, and uh, set the whole thing up, and they could release within uh, probably 20 minutes of when the target was found. I that I see. For a, uh, an enemy infantryman on the ground, it was absolutely, positively, a terrorist weapon. It had to be a terrorist weapon because they couldn't hear us. All they could hear was, would be five seconds before impact, the scream of the bombs coming down. And uh, so the impact would occur before they could even take a breath. In the late 60s, the Air Force again tried to replace their B-52s and requested another supersonic bomber. But unlike the XB-70, this one was to be a low altitude penetrator capable of speeds exceeding twice the speed of sound. Rockwell's design for the B-1 was selected 
and the first prototype flew in 1974. But President Carter canceled the program in 1977 and recommended further development of the air-launched cruise missile. The B-1's cancellation sparked a series of high-tech improvements to the B-52 that enhanced its life expectancy while extending its attack range and combat survivability. Electro-optical and infrared cameras were installed under the nose, allowing the lower deck navigators a night vision capability. Well, the Boeing B-52 Stratofortress is probably the classic post-war bomber. It must be the best known bomber aircraft in the world, not only for its operations in Vietnam, but of course recently in Desert Storm. American engineers have been able to develop it to survive into the 1980s and 90s by adding electronic warfare equipment, by taking away its self-defense guns, which were found in the 70s to be of no use whatsoever. It's the sort of design that it said that the pilots flying today had fathers and grandfathers who flew it in the service. It's, it's a classic because you have been able to, to work on it, to develop it, and to create something which will probably keep flying for at least another 10 years. The decision to finally build the B-1 bomber came from President Reagan, who was convinced the right combination of smart electronics could defeat the radar defenses the Soviets were likely to build in the 1990s and beyond. The newer B-1B model is still designed to penetrate Soviet airspace at low altitudes. Its top speed at 200 feet is 600 miles per hour. The B-1B carries 92,000 pounds of conventional and nuclear weapons. Its payload is nearly twice the amount of the B-52, yet its radar return signature is only one-tenth that of a B-52. In November 1988, the United States revealed one of the closest guarded military secrets since the atomic bomb, the most sophisticated aircraft ever developed, the B-2 Stealth Bomber. As it turned out, Northrop Corporation was given another chance to prove its flying wing concept. Once operational, the B-2 Bomber will have the capability to penetrate the most sophisticated enemy radar with conventional or nuclear bombs. It relies on its low-profile stealth design and radar-absorbing skin to evade detection until it is closed within a few miles of its target. Much of the stealth's airframe is made of classified composite materials which allow for high strength and low observability. And the problem is, of course, that when it comes to tire technology, it takes a while to, des uh, to design and to develop it. It also costs a lot of money. And there have been various estimates as to the, the price of a B-2 bomber. It costs about a billion dollars for each one. And really, you've got to decide whether or not there's a need to carry nuclear weapons into the heart of the Soviet Union unseen in the 1990s. With the arrival of the B-2, bombers have taken another step toward technical achievement and enormous destructive potential. With each advance, however, one constant remains, the moral dilemma of the bombing crews who must wrestle with the devastating effects of their mission and their responsibility to mankind. The crews are very well aware of the, the power that they contain within their bomb bays, that, that it's a, a, a tremendous weapon. They're very, very philosophically concerned about the results of what they do. There's no sense of vainglory. There's no sense of bloodthirstiness. It's simply a job that's got to be done. And you do it with the minimum casualties, but you do it. I think quite often it was a case of uh, thinking in terms of dedication to a mission, quite frankly, an assignment, but never with the thought that it was devoid of a taking of a life or destruction of a life. And I think as you tend to get a little bit older, as time goes on, you tend to consider that more and you come to realize even more that war is a hell of a way to settle differences. There's got to be a better way. Got to be.
near the end of World War I, Orville Wright wrote hopefully to a friend, the airplane has made war so terrible that I do not believe any country will again care to start a war. Perhaps the bomber has evolved into the weapon that will finally make Orville Wright's prophecy come true.